All right. So yes, in uh, in this presentation, I'm going to give an overview and a demo on uh, how uh, we are uh, changing and improving the Climate for Impact portal. And uh, the difference behind though that, that is that basically uh, we wanted to have a better usability of the user interface. Uh, so Christian was mentioning about the complexity of dealing with the facets, for instance. And uh, so we are trying to smooth up that uh, uh, smooth the edges of those uh, type of uh, uh, searches, which might be quite complicated sometimes. Uh, Christian also introduced uh, IC Gleam, a lot of possibilities, but you might need to do post-processing or pre-processing. So we are trying to change a little bit the flow in which we can uh, perform analysis in C4I. And uh, of course, uh, now we are also expecting uh, uh, that, uh, especially new scientists, uh, they will be much more keen in uh, developing their own methods uh, uh, by themselves and share these methods among each other. Uh, I mean, that's an interesting, uh, because uh, many, uh, uh, from the point of view of uh, uh, a number of uh, researchers also uh, we've been working with uh, in, uh, in the past in all the fields, it seems like uh, uh, having the possibility actually to develop their own uh, code uh, with uh, analysis tools like Isaac Link, for instance, and then share their methods is something which is becoming uh, very appealing. Uh, uh, beside that, uh, there is also the possibility uh, and the problem of having uh, the methods that you apply for your research uh, also reproducible. So I guess that every of you guys are aware of the IPCC yeah. as well as a, as a sort of a, a political, if you like, infrastructure that are providing information about climate change worldwide. And uh, so now they are asking scientists to share the methods on how they developed even a plot. So because it's very important that we are reproducible in a way that we conduct our analysis. So in that respect, for those who have experience in Python or R, have you ever used uh, Jupyter Notebooks? Okay, Arun is familiar with that, Maria Letizia as well. Oh, that's good. Yeah, so it seems like uh, Python is less famous, but Jupyter, which is uh, a development environment for Python, is more famous. Okay. That's a good thing because uh, I think that Jupyter gave the opportunity to share more of the simplest code that you can ever develop. And so it's, it's an actually a uh, very good tool for communication. Uh, problem with that <coughs> is that it's not reproducible per se. So you need a lot of information behind Jupyter to make sure that other people can run. Uh, your method and uh, it's not it's I mean it's the data but it's also the the software libraries uh, and uh, the version uh, but we will go through that uh, so one of these aspects that I already mentioned so more analysis features automated automated reproducibility mechanism so you don't have to care about that much if you're uh, uh, if you're going to share something that will uh, actually run for someone else, because uh, uh, the climate for impact uh, will take care about it. Uh, another question, in fact, that I had. Uh, so when you start to work in your, your, in your new institutions, uh, the data and software policy of your institution was requesting you to use any virtual management system like uh, Git, GitLab or uh, things like, uh, yeah. Because for instance, this is uh, uh, not yet. <laughs> not yet, because uh, is it something that uh, you feel it's coming or uh, it's something that uh, 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 no one was ever uh, worried? Someone hopes so, okay. Because also when you're gonna publish uh, a paper, hopefully uh, soon for each of you, or you had published it in the past, uh, there are some journals, they starting to ask you, okay, where is the code that you used to do this analysis? Where are we, where can we access it? So if you don't have uh, an account on a repository management, on a version management system, uh, you might even be sort of rejected the paper uh, altogether. So these are new policies which are coming in in many in, in many journals, 
So we are trying to uh, sort of catch up with uh, the limitations of the current, uh, uh, if you like, uh, data portal and websites that uh, are giving uh, much, uh, not, not enough guidance and not enough support to automate these processes as well. All, the, all what I'm, I'm talking about goes uh, into the concept of uh, data fairness. So you might go to conferences which are talking about data management, uh, uh, challenges in reproducibility or modern science, and you will start listening to this concept coming up very often, which is fair. Making data fair means that the data should be uh, findable, accessible, uh, should be interoperable among systems, uh, and then it should be used and reproducible also in terms of the method. So you, we have seen in the data uh, climate for impact so far that we have a lot of metadata, uh, these are already contributing to some sort of fairness. We have a way of access, uh, so the data is accessible. And uh, but we don't have yet uh, a way to make uh, the methods completely shareable and reproducible. So this is also something that new systems and new portals should take care of. And of course, uh, then there is a little bit of uh, the geeky part of that from our end that we wanted to make a system which was uh, easier to be extended. So we redeveloped the, the whole front end. Uh, so what we have done is basically uh, analyzing the typical use cases of the modern researchers where uh, uh, what uh, uh, he or she would like to do is to access is to access distributed raw data which are on different uh, residing on different systems so uh, find and access this type of information uh, they should be able to develop at the same time a document and also use the methods uh, and uh, visualization techniques that uh, might find uh, uh, appealing for uh, for their analysis uh, the data change uh, and the software also change over time. You might want to use a new version of uh, a matplotlib uh, function, for instance, or library to visualize information. So you would like to install it and uh, update your data set with a new version because you realize that what you have done before was running uh, on a version of the data set that maybe has got less quality features. Uh, at the same time, you want to be able to track all these changes and have the possibility to roll back to something that you did uh, maybe a year ago to see how things uh, has been uh, improved over time. Or uh, what are the difference of applying the same, the same method on different versions of the data. So therefore, it's also important to keep the old version of the data under the radar. So in a way that you can make comparisons. And eventually, talking about the reproducibility, a modern researcher should really be uh, concerned about making sure that uh, what he or she are developing can be reproduced by someone else. These are all complicated things to handle all by yourself. So we are trying to develop systems that are uh, helping you in uh, achieving uh, uh, many of these tasks. So uh, the new development within Climate for Impact, therefore, uh, uh, have the objective of extending it with the data-driven and uh, reproducible workspaces. So we will have a new user interface that kind of uh, uh, ease uh, the discovery of the data among uh, the ESGF nodes. Uh, eventually, you will get to select the data in different ways and uh, uh, from a single files to trigger uh, subsetting uh, uh, parameters in a way that you actually reduce the amount of data that you might uh, move around because you can imagine, especially for CMIP6, the resolution is very high. So, and the data is located in different sites. So it's better to do some subsetting uh, remotely when you start to move a large amount of data in your own environment. So your own environment uh, is driven uh, within C4i uh, in the new version by uh, a Jupyter Lab instance. This Jupyter Lab instance uh, uh, will give you automatically uh, access to the data that you have selected and uh, will give you access uh, to your uh, Git account in a way that once you have develop, uh, developed and satisfied about a method that you uh, is, uh, is actually representing your findings, producing your findings, uh, 
This can be automatically stored with you to Git in your account. So all the reproducibility information are there. You can share them with other people, but not only other people will be able to execute what you have achieved. And this is thanks uh, to the technologies which are basically behind Jupyter itself, which are uh, capable of uh, getting a repository and replaying uh, all uh, your research. Uh, and that contains the software, your method, and also means to access the data. So we don't copy large data in your repository, but we have a way to get them from uh, C4i. Uh, so how this has been developed is basically by extending uh, Jupyter Lab uh, also with uh, uh, a new set of uh, uh, methods and the user interface components, which are basically allowing you to monitor all the activities that you've done, like uh, creating a new notebook, uh, running an update. By update, we mean uh, uh, sort of uh, installing new libraries in your environment, creating snapshots into Git, uh, and then also the possibility to roll back. So restore, imagine that you have installed a library that uh, uh, it's screwing up your whole environment and nothing is working anymore. You would like to go back to a situation where all these libraries uh, were working better. Uh, so we trace all these updates in a way that you can always go back to a situation where your environment was healthy. Uh, so now, Going into the next phase, of course, so when you do a snapshot, uh, you see that uh, uh, everything will be produced for you in your own account. Uh, I'm going to show you how it works in real life. So this is the new front end of Climate for Impact. It has been a little bit uh, uh, sort of uh, cleaned up uh, of uh, a number of uh, uh, less, uh, uh, let's say, between uh, what's important information. I mean, everything is important, but not everything has to be in the foreground. So now we are giving basically the possibility to choose uh, among uh, uh, nicely defined uh, uh, properties. You can move around the different uh, uh, facets which we consider more important in terms of uh, uh, performing your uh, your search so among experiments models uh, we will, we are going also to add another one to dig into the ensembles that you want to run so the experiment mind numbers so the way it works uh, is for instance you go and, and select for uh, some variables here that you might be interested in you get into the frequency domain, going for a daily average, for instance, uh, and uh, you can select uh, uh, among different experiments. And uh, also, uh, you can go for a model selection. So there is no real uh, sort of sequence in how you set these parameters here. So you can always go back and change features. But uh, so the idea is that you have them uh, under control. So uh, once you're done your first selection, basically you can go for uh, uh, a selection of the data set that you would like to uh, access, download. Uh, you see that uh, in this way, in this standard way of accessing the data, you have the possibility to dig into the single files uh in a way that you can uh, select uh, a subset of the whole lot which is available on the node this is available also for uh, for each of the variables if you see task max and task me uh so i show you that uh, if i select the whole uh, task max uh, i can say here download the list which is just uh, an, uh, a file with all the links to the data that you might uh, run it uh, in uh, i don't know wherever uh, local machines, uh, local machine you might have. But the most interesting part is that you can export it to a notebook. So now you see that I already have a notebook uh, in, uh, in my uh, account. So existing notebook found. It's telling me that I'm using uh, 12 gigabyte out of the 16 gigabyte, which are now available in my, uh, in my notebook instance. So it's telling me, okay, this is not gonna go because you are asking for 11 gigabyte of data. So maybe you want to open a new one. 
So you could do that. In the current version, uh, you're going to lose the one that you have because we have a limited space. Uh, I mean, uh, CNIP SIPs data are quite large, so we need to tune a little bit on uh, resources that we might offer to the end users. But I mean, this is a problem that we will face when we go live. Uh, what I can, uh, uh, for instance, show before I get to the notebook itself is that I can go, for instance, to a different data set. Uh, select a couple of data from here, so high granularity choices of what I'm going to download, and then I can say again, export to notebook. So it should fit within my space because uh, uh, the amount of data is, is only 420 uh, megabyte now. So I say, yeah, go and uh, uh, get the data into my notebook. And then I say, okay, let's go and see it. So what's happening here is that uh, a notebook is loaded for me. Uh, you see that uh, I already had one, so I have a number of uh, things in there that I already executed. I can go into my own uh, uh, Swivel extension where I can see the activities which I have been uh, executed. You see that the workflow job is running. This means that uh, uh, data is being downloaded, so it takes time. So, but uh, we got always the feedback about what's the status of uh, the download on the back end. Uh, so, if I go into the folder structure of my notebook here, I see that there is a data folder. So, this data folder is showing uh, the latest which is basically the collection of all the files that I have downloaded so far in the latest version. Uh, but what you see as well is that we have a staging history. The staging history is basically showing you uh, every time I have uh, included new data in my notebook, it's giving uh, the overview of uh, what I have done. So this is the last one that I triggered probably just now. Uh, this is the first one that I triggered eight, eight, uh, 18 hours ago. So you see that, uh, uh, for instance, in the last one, you will have uh, uh, data. Let me see. So this has been downloaded a minute ago. So which means that this is the last request that I did, for instance. Uh, I have always the possibility to see which are the data that has been downloaded uh, newly just now, all the data which basically were already there and changed. So for each step, for every time I update my notebook, I can have uh, an exact history of uh, how the data has changed in my archive. The important thing for having this feature is that in your code, you can select always to compare different versions of the data. Because if, you're, if your analysis uh, is different, maybe the reason is not in your code, but the data has changed. There will be an update on the ESGF. So we don't have a control on that. So that's why we consider it important to keep the different versions uh, up to date. So, Alessandro, yes. there's, a, there's a question from Anastasia. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Can we select or choose a small box or download just a region of interest? Uh, yeah, I'll go there like, afterwards. Definitely. Okay. Yeah, that's uh, that's uh, the next thing that you're gonna, we're going to roll out uh, in uh, in the next, uh, basically, couple of weeks. But uh, yes, that's going to be possible. Uh, so, but going uh, forward in this in this flow here, so let's uh, uh, make it clean again. Uh, so you see that my data has been downloaded. So I get a, a, a green check here. So I know my data is in there and uh, uh, you will see also uh, that uh, uh, the activities uh, have been up to date. This is done now. So I've been executing the workflow. Uh, okay, but now I want to do this analysis, right? So uh, here I have uh, my typical Jupyter space where uh, I can uh, maybe upload. Uh, for instance, uh, we have a notebook developed, I guess, with what IC Clean. Uh, so this is a very easy, uh, simple example. Uh, so Christian can also tell better what it does. 
But uh, I mean, by reading here, it calculates the number of summer days as two indicators for the uh, the data set uh, that uh, I chose. Uh, so it was basically a selection of data that uh, I already did uh, yesterday, for instance, because I mean, it can take up to 15 minutes to stage uh, a very large amount of data. So that's why I preloaded the data into the notebook. Uh, but uh, the important thing here is that uh, once uh, I have uploaded this file uh, to my notebook online, then I can start executing it. And you see that you might have missing things. So I don't have Matplotlib. So I want to do some visualization, but I don't have that library in the environment. Okay, it's not a problem. Jupyter is uh, flexible enough that allows you to do an install of Matplotlib. Plot lib, if I spelled it correctly. No, I didn't. Mat plot lib. Yeah, it's spelled. So now things should should have been installed. As far as I've seen here, already satisfied. So let's see if I run this again. Now matplotlib is installed. If I see into my action list, I have also an update executed just now where I installed a new library and I can go on and do my analysis. So you see that now uh, IcGleam is uh, performing this calculation. Christian, if you want just to, to uh, chip in and tell us what is IcGleam doing at the moment. I mean, you, we make it even more uh, uh, exciting. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the uh, IcGleam is loading the data, but in, when we launched the IcGleam, if you see in the parameters, we have a transfer limit of uh, 200 megabytes. Um, so it is like uh, that because we don't want to load uh, all the data at once, especially if we load the remote data, which is not the case here because we have local. Now here, uh, there's no locally, but uh, yeah. yeah. But anyway, it does work even locally, but it's why it says loading data chunk one out of eight. It's because it will load the data in chunk and then it calculates uh, for each chunk uh, at a time. So it takes time because uh, those are global files, the high resolution. So this is why it's, it takes a bit. But this is also one of the reasons why, and I'm connecting to the first question, which was uh, uh, about can we select on a region or in a time? So we are anticipating this phase now at workflow level. So we don't uh, stage any more uh, data which we are not interested in and do this uh, post-processing within the notebook itself, but we will be able uh, to do it uh, uh, while the workflow, by the workflow itself. So you will have a restricted amount of data within your space where you can uh, possibly do analysis straight away and you won't have to parse uh, all this data. Uh, but uh, now, I mean, uh, this is, uh, it, it will finish, but uh, it might take uh, a little bit of time. Uh, in the meantime, uh, that this is going on, uh, what I can show you is still the possibilities offered by the, our extension here. You see that here there is a GitHub knob. Uh, I can log in to my uh, GitHub account. So this is also a disclaimer about the privacy. I mean, we are giving the access uh, from Swirl and C4I to another resource that we have online. I mean, it's, it's nearly when you use uh, your Gmail uh, to log in on uh, your, uh, I don't know, whatever other social network, for instance. So this will go into uh, A login phase, the computation is still going on, which is nice. Uh, but uh, what you see here uh, is that uh, 
uh, I think that the computation didn't go ahead. Sorry about that. Alessandro, also in the other uh, notebook, which calculates something else with ICLIMP, I, um, uh, I have uh, completed the, the notebook so you can see the results already made in the other. Uh, yeah, you can show that. But uh, yeah, what I wanted to do is uh, uh, I'm uh, just, I think that my, my permission were uh, expired. So that's why that didn't work. So I want to log in again to create the snapshot to, to, uh, to my GitHub account. So I show the results in the other space for sure. Uh, what should be, Christian? The anomaly task max. This one? Yeah. You see, I updated the 20 minutes, 22 minutes ago. If you scroll ah, okay. down. Ah, okay. Yes. Uh, this one. Yeah, just forget. Yeah, yeah. Just don't look, don't look at the error because it, it's no problem. Yeah, because yeah, I, uh, okay, sure. Uh, at the end, I don't have a graphical output yet. But I show you that we have the result in a two D uh, field. Yeah. So the story here is that basically uh, you, you can create a number of different uh, uh, implementation of uh, uh, of your methods here without being bound necessarily to a click and play interface. But you can code your own uh, your own. Um, uh, methods and control the data that you move and eventually uh, you basically can also uh, create a snapshot which is uh, uh, storing your own environment like if I type in C4I demo snapshot uh, this should uh, basically create uh, a copy of this environment uh, within uh, my own account, assuming that all the credentials uh, have been uh, have been granted. Uh, so, what's going on behind the scenes is that uh, uh, what is uh, uh, behind the, the environment which uh, I have created the, the software, which was basically needed to run the example. And also, uh, the data information is not here. So I think that my 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 authorization didn't go through. So I'm going to show you what I have uh, what I have prepared already. So for instance, this is a uh, because I've done this uh, already, of course, uh, uh, yesterday. Uh, but so now. In my GitHub, what I have uh, is that uh, I have the whole environment uh, which uh, I used uh, uh, to create my analysis uh, stored. So if I get into the test icicle, this is the notebook that uh, I basically uh, was running and then I interrupted, but you will see that also the visualization in the, is there. And uh, uh, so what you can do with this repository, which is entirely uh, created automatically for you, is that uh, you go into this other tool, which is called Binder. Binder is a, uh, is a cloud service offered by uh, the Jupyter project itself, where uh, what you do is basically you take your repository here and uh, you paste it uh, into the uh, GitHub uh, of my binder, and then basically uh, this guy is gonna uh, reproduce the notebook for you. So once uh, uh, the data is collected uh, from your uh, Jupyter uh, session in uh, C4i, uh, you will have uh, the possibility, so this is basically now uh, building and launching the server, you will have the possibility to share your notebook uh, uh, with someone else and give them the opportunity to run it or, uh, or play with it. 
So at the end of the day, uh, it is uh, an integrated services which is allowing uh, uh, climate for impact to be uh, much more flexible in the type of analysis that can be uh, offered. If we go to the first question again, where basically you wanted to allow uh, a subset of the selection. So we have this other option here, which is opened up. This is at the moment uh, uh, implemented only, uh, let's say, on the user interface. We have the workflow already behind, but uh, uh, we haven't integrated yet within the current version. But basically, if I select for one of the data set here, and uh, I go and set the parameters. I have the possibility here to set uh, spatial information and also temporal information in a way that uh, once I uh, start the process of downloading the data, this data will be subset. And the subsetting is happening at the node side. So we will uh, have uh, a way reduced amount of data in our notebook. And we will also have uh, the possibility of uh, move a little bit of these computational uh, uh, challenges and uh, uh, resources uh, at the site of the uh, data provider. And uh, Alessandra, can you show us what, what Binder has done by now? Binder is uh, building uh, our uh, repository in oh, a way that, it's yeah. not ready yet. No, no, this is, uh, uh, I mean, it's, uh, th there is a lot of data that has to be moved around. So you, you need to also always to take into account that uh, this is all happening online uh, because, uh, I mean, we are talking about several gigabytes of data. So uh, it works eventually, but uh, it, it has to establish communication with data. See, but in this case, uh, uh, we weren't lucky. But uh, yeah, so it has uh, to rely on the resources provided uh, by the service on the background. So uh, we don't have control of our set from Binder at the moment. But uh, I mean, I can tell you that, uh, uh, see, for instance, now it's working, see? <laughs> So sometimes there are glitches going on behind the scenes, but uh, this is our uh, notebook. So this is what we developed within C4i. Now this is running in a completely different world, but uh, it's fully reproducible. So you see that now matplotlib will be already installed. The computation is going on, possibly even faster. I don't know, we can check that. So actually we are uh, uh, looking for volunteers because this is a, a new rolled out tool. Uh, meantime, you know, the computation here went uh, went on. Uh, and we can replay the whole thing. So that's, uh, that's a nice example of uh, reproducibility in a, in a different context uh, with the, you see that the data is all here. Eh? So this is the whole data that we use to do the analysis. It's more than uh, 10 gigabytes of data that you had there. So, but going to that question, uh, yes, I can uh, uh, move uh, to the demonstration, to the present, because uh, so uh, this is the whole technological part which is going on behind the scenes. It's not, it's less of an interest for you, it's on the slide, but uh, the main concept that we have here is that we use a provenance data model uh, to capture all what you do with the system. So uh, don't be worried about privacy. At the moment, we don't manage any user information, but we do control how you use the machine in a way that we can do all these reproducibility actions. Uh, we store this into a graph database and we use it uh, uh, for your benefit only. And uh, the next phase is actually uh, indeed uh, trying to push this service uh, to something that can be opened up to the community. Uh, I've been talking already about uh, uh, integrating uh, uh, remote subsetting uh, through OpenDAP. So this is still using uh, uh, IC Clean, for instance, but it will be transparent to you. It's going behind the scenes. Uh, we want to give uh, multiple workspaces per users in a way that uh, you can uh, create uh, bulks of data, which are, uh, and this is really important, 
Like uh, when you do and use these technologies, uh, it's much better if you create workspaces which are dedicated to what you are doing at the moment. And the important thing is that uh, because if you want to share this, uh, everything will be packaged there. So other people can just run. You don't have to explain, uh, throw away this data, don't use that one. It's all in there. So that's why we want to allow you to create more context. Uh, more metadata will be also added uh, to the search in a way that you can use uh, uh, the link to the persistent uh, uh, identifier, which is associated uh, with the data set. Uh, I already said that we will extend to model members and uh, uh, we will inc include also the authorization for callback data uh, within uh, uh, this instance. Last but not least, we are looking for uh, uh, volunteers which are uh, going uh, to help us uh, in uh, uh, testing uh, the features which are rolled out in the next year. So, uh, of course, uh, uh, we would like to have uh, uh, people that are interested in using uh, the service uh, with such a uh, uh, variety of flexibility and uh, also interested uh, in looking a little bit uh, in how future scientists uh, might be actually required to do their work. So where uh, you will have to consider aspect uh, of uh, implementing your own code. So learning about Python, learning about IcGleam, learning about how to document uh, what you're doing uh, and uh, being reproducible. So I would also actually ask uh, uh, after this presentation if there would be uh, people interested in becoming an alpha tester. So okay. thanks. Thank you. So it, this is not really open yet to large public, uh, but it's open to well, some individual people who can test it. Yes. And uh, well, if there are more people who want to help with testing, then that would be very useful, I think.